Okay, thanks. Welcome everybody again. It's a honor to be chairing this session, truly, and I thank the organizers for thinking about it. So, this uh, session is about abiotic stresses under climate change, which is what we put in the introduction of all our projects lately. And uh, we all know that barley is a very tough and resilient crop, but uh, even barley is gonna, going to have tough times in the, in the future. So, uh, when looking for a keynote speaker, we tried to find someone who could cover every stress that barley can feel. And you would say, there's not that many people working in so many stresses at the same time. Well, there is. And it's my pleasure to introduce to Sergei Shabala, our keynote speaker. He's the head of the Stress Physiology, Physiology Lab at the University of Tasmania. And he works in stress physiology, salinity, water logging, drought, nutritional disorders. How can he do that? Well, he looks at the mechanisms of uh, membrane transport and cell environment interaction. Right, yeah. Uh, I must confess I'm black sheep here because I'm a physiologist. I don't think we're at too many of, but maybe it's not bad. I'll try to convince you that physiology with some salt in it. And I believe actually that phenotyping, which I'll be talking today, is a major limiting factor in our breeding programs because here we have all these tremendous developments in our genetic approaches and uh, omic techniques, but the phenotyping still sort of lacking back. So before I go further, I acknowledge all these people who made contribution. Well, this is a small part of that. So members of my lab and my collaborators. In fact, I published papers with 140 labs in the world, so I'm really a technique-based person. So if someone interested in what I'm doing, my email is available, so you're most welcome to email me saying, I have this interesting mutant or interesting plant. Just do something what you're doing on your plants for that. Now, putting that in a global context and uh, biotic stresses, why it's important. Uh, Brian just mentioned importance of biotic stresses uh, for barley. Uh, biotic stresses cost industry about $180 billion in lost production, and it's only for four stresses I'm working with. So I presume it's much more than that. And you can talk about drought, flooding, salinity, and very often it happens on the same paddock in the same field, just different times of a year. So when you look at these graphs here, the amount of the sort of cataclysmic events, it's going up and up um, with time, and we don't really expect it will be better than that. So if we put ourselves in the future, let's say 20, 30 years from now, where we are ending up with the current agronomy and breeding strategies. The summary is we'll be losing the race. Uh, 10 years ago, Peter Langridge and Mark Tester published a very nice paper in Science where they analyzed the production of cereals. So these blue lines here on this graph, they are historical records of the amount of cereals produced in the world. And they just extrapolated the same line. So we do business as usual. We keep breeding in the same pace. We keep improving agronomy practices with the same speed. And we'll end up somewhere here. But we need to be here. So we need to increase actually productivity by 38% to feed all the population, 9.9 .9 billion, which we expect to have by 2050, which is a challenging task. It's simply not possible with existing breeding and agronomy practices. So I don't want really to sound negative, but if we continue as we do now, for the last 10, 15 years, 20 years, I think we'll end up losing this race. So we need to step outside the square and do something drastic to change the situation. So what can be done, what should be changed or can be changed? The classical way of breeding, again, I'm not a geneticist, not a breeder, but I work with a lot of breeders, so actually a lot of funding in my lab is for pre-breeding programs. Uh, so we better look which genotype or which plant perform better in a field. We try to find you know, interesting wild relatives. We do their various type of breeding, particularly from our consistent selection, and we do phenotyping, and the companies put enormous pressure on us to buy these new phenotyping platforms, which are very fancy and nice looking. They cost many, many millions of dollars, like I think Adelaide Plant Accelerator is about $35 million, and you have these nice and shiny conveyor belts, which really move the plants from one point to another one, and you can take a pictures in different uh, spectrum of the light, and you can see which plant is doing better. 
The problem with that phenotyping is it's very good for simple single gene control agronomical traits, like flowering time or you know number of tealers or something like that. There's no problem with that, but these cameras just replace your eyes and they don't really provide the insights into the mechanistic basis of plant responses. So when we talk about stresses, we're talking about much, much more serious problem because many stresses controlled by numerous mechanisms and each of these mechanisms is conferred by the dozens of different genes. So putting them together in one package is a highly challenging task and the visual phenotyping by how green or how tall is a plant will not tell you which genes of these 200 or 300 responsible for that. So, uh, nice paper again published by Hasedinini uh, 15 years ago in Science uh, showed just a simple illustration of the fact what I said. When you do the cross section of the root, longitudinal or cross sectional cuts, and you look at the tissue specific expression of different genes, you'll see enormous complexity. We have the myriad on several thousands of genes expressed in a tissue specific manner. When you do this whole plant phenotyping using this screening platforms, which I see on overall operation of these genes without understanding how they are working together. So if you want really to improve something uh, based on holistic approach and knowledge of the function of a gene, this whole plant screening is simply counterproductive. I don't want to be um, too rude to people, but I want to illustrate it by salinity, which is probably one of the major stresses which I'm working with due to different reasons, uh, funding and also importance for the Australia. So if you look at the salinity, and this example is in rice, you can see that there are four different chromosomes where you can find the difference in the loci responsible for sodium accumulation. So it's pretty broad, I would say, spectrum of that. And if you are a breeder, if I ask you, okay, what do you do with this data? You probably say, well, not much practical because it's too many to handle. But this is how it was done. So for 50 years, breeding for cylinder tolerance was done by selecting varieties which do not accumulate sodium in the shoot because we believe the sodium toxicity is the biggest constraint imposed on plants by cylinder stress. And again, the reasons are pure logistical. Uh, it's easier to do high throughput screening. It's relatively cheap and everyone can measure it without much of equipment. A simple flame photometer will do it. So, uh, does it work? Uh, I think uh, most of my colleagues in the field now will say, no, it failed this approach. The, one of the best examples, illustration of success is then we look at the HKT15 gene. I'm not sure how many people in this audience work with Salinti, but this is a very, very famous candidate gene, which is really uh, known to be targeted in many papers and projects. So, uh, my colleague from Adelaide, Rana Mans, um, Mark Tester and others published a nice paper in Nature Biotech when they found this gene in one of their wheat uh, uh, ancestor uh, species and they introduced it into the elite varieties and they reported 25% increase in the yield under salon conditions. So when you read the abstract of this Nature paper, it's all great. But when you look at the actual numbers and tables shown there, uh, you will see that only in one field out of three where they tested in the field was a beneficial effect. And even that 25 increase in productivity was still 50% loss compared with non-saline conditions. So obviously we are not nearly there where we need to be for true improvement of salt tolerance in cereals. Rice is worse, but it's relatively tolerant. We have varieties in, my, in our lab which can tolerate 300 millimolar of sodium chloride with just 50% yield loss, but it's still yield loss. And we have halophytes which can be irrigated by seawater and have no reduction in yield. So, why is that? What can we do? We look at this aspect of tissue specificity of gene operation and we ask very, very simple question at the beginning. Uh, do all the root tissues have the same sensitivity to salt or not? And for doing that, we just did very simple experiments. So we designed, this is a photon, this is a model. We designed a sort of multi-compartment chamber. So you have several partitions and you expose the root to salinity in different places. So in this compartment, which is mature zone, this just five millimeter long root segment and you can put salt here and have controls elsewhere or you can put salt to the tip, the same five millimeter from the apex and see how plants are responding. So when we did this growth assays and results are shown here and we use also mannitol as isotonic control. So when we apply salt to mature zone, nothing happened root growth. It keeps growing without any things for the next few days. However, when we apply salt for root apex, 
you have the arrest of the root growth in immediately, just 98% inhibition. So you can see nothing to do with lignification of the root, by the way. So you see that there's a difference in sensitivity. So when you analyze the gene responses in the entire bulk of the root, you're missing this because the sensor and ability to respond and sensor stress is in the apex, not in the bulk of the root. Uh, why is that? Well, you can do a lot of different things, but we did metabolic profiling different tissues in different uh, parts of the root, and you can see that the, like 70-80% of metabolites are changing in the root apex, and very few of them are changing in the zone. So obviously we talk about this specificity, not only at transcription level, and Jose showed before in the NHS, or in the science paper, but we also look at the functional level, and we have a lot of changes. And by the way, look at this, what happened when you apply the salt stress to mature tissue and uh, root apex in terms of potassium retention. You have massive loss in apex, and you have almost no response in mature zone. So it is specific. So the summary until now is we need to move from whole plant phenotyping to the way of phenotyping plants or screening plants for operation of a specific gene in a specific tissue where it belongs and later integrated in a, in a one sort of type of the idea type and response. So we need to use techniques which will be sensitive enough and implant them to look at operation of these genes. So I'll be talking in the next 10 minutes about two of these approaches. So one is electrophysiological approach when we use the microelectrode techniques, in particular microelectrode micro ion flux measuring technique, MIF. And now one is using the fluorescent dyes when you really can look at the distribution of ions between different compartments and organelles. So the MIF technique is my baby in the lab. I think I'm running the world's largest lab. We have eight rigs. It was invented in our university. And in a very brief, you have the microelectrode capillary with few micron diameter. You put the ion selective cocktail, put it on a mechanical manipulator, computer driven, and computer moves it up and down, up and down between, let's say, 10 micron above root surface and 50 micron. And what it does, it basically counts the number of ions crossing the membrane every second. And cocktail can be selective for sodium, potassium, calcium, nitrate, ammonium, phosphate, you just name it. And Essentially, we can see, okay, these cells require that much phosphate, these cells require that much nitrate for optimal performance, and stress conditions make it different. So this technique is uh, rather powerful because it's non-invasive, so you can accompany the growing roots, you can accompany the growing tropic roots and other things. You can measure it from single cell. The tip size is few microns, so we can measure from hair, root hair, pollen tube, anything. Uh, we can even measure bacteria and chloroplasts if you apply some special tricks. So what we did, we applied this technique to look at the importance of potassium retention and salt tolerance in barley, and that was really work about 15 years ago. So what we did, we look at the contrasting varieties, and we found here that varieties which are really tolerant, so this is a result of one month in a glass house salinity treatment. So these varieties in a blue and green lose very little potassium, so the more down on the scale here, the more sensitive plant is. And this is a sensitive variety which was killed within a month. But if you apply this technique to three days old seedlings in growing petri dish, tiny, tiny ones, in half an hour, I can predict that these varieties will be dying in a month. So we have, we did some crossing, we did F1 population and found very strong inheritance of this trait. So basically what we did, we developed the physiological marker you can apply to tiny, tiny seedlings, two, three days old, predict their performance in a glass house in the field, uh, for months-long experiments. Again, Zhang Hua Chen, who is now a dean in a Sydney University, one of our earlier PhD students in the lab, did that as part of his PhD project, spent two years screening plants in a field in glass house, and in two months in a lab, he found very strong correlation. R square 0.62, that means 60% of genetic variability in salt tolerance is explained by ability of the root to retain potassium. The trait, which was never targeted by breeders in the past, and when I ask the reasons why, Rana Mans is my good colleague and friend, and she's a legend in Salinity Field, her answer was very simple. It costs money. We decided that sodium is more important than potassium, so we ignore potassium. So again, it's very, very sad and sort of simple explanation, but logistics really. So phenotyping is also driven by convenience and a high throughput rather than the science being science-based. We all know that the ability plants to sequester sodium in vacuole is a critical for tissue tolerance, and that's one of the key determinants of salinity 
adaptation to salinity stress. So that's all the halophyte, so the salt-loving species doing. They can accumulate the concentration of salt over seawater level in their vacuoles. How can we look at that? Well, we can isolate the tonoplast membranes or vacuoles by enzymatic digestion and measure transport of sodium across them directly with this MIFE technique. Or for more half throughput, we can put the fluorescent dye, corona green, and we can look at the profile between the sodium in a cytosol vacuole. So you see, again, the font is probably too small, but this is cytosol, this is vacuole, and this is sensitive variety, and this is a torn variety, so pick is in vacuole and less sodium in cytosol. So we can really probably do, you know, dozens of genotypes per day, we just matter of 10 minutes of loading of the dye and later going to the confocal scan laser microscopy and looking at the distribution of ions. So we can really screen for NHX donors and later go through the you know, market-assisted selection to create the varieties with better ability to sequester sodium and vacuole. This example is for wheat, but nonetheless, the principle is the same. So we know that the SOS1 transporter, single gene encoded by SOS1, sorry, single protein encoded by SOS1 gene, confers for sodium exchanger. So one hydrogen goes in opposite direction by one proton, sorry, by one sodium, and sodium is pumped out. So 95% of salt which is taken by plants is pumped back to rhizosphere immediately by source one transporter. So how we know whether it's efficient operation or not? Well, we can use our technique with sodium electrodes and we can look at the varieties and ability to pump in a so-called recovery protocols. So rare varieties with low pumping abilities, so only like 300 arbitrary units, and here right is more than 1,000. So if you do take one from here, one from here, create the DH lines, you can really look at the QTLs for the source one. And I presume, and I'm pretty certain, it will be just one sharp QTL because we're talking about operation of a specific protein, just one of them. But what was interesting when we apply this approach and look at the overall sodium distribution in roots, we found the things which we did not expect to find at all. Normally we expect that the less sodium is accumulated in plants, the more happy they are, and therefore their tolerance will be higher. And that was definitely true for the mature root zone, and that was definitely true for ability to sequester in vacuole. So these numbers are relative fluorescent intensity of these sodium dye in different parts. But look at that box in red here, in meristem. In a cytosol of the tolerant group, we have one for 59, and in sensitive, only 37 units. It's four times more sodium in the meristem of a tolerant variety. So there is a sensor present or harbored by meristem and it's operate and send a signal to the shoot to operate and adapt to saline conditions. So when we did some pretty barbarian things, we chop up the meristem with a scalpel blade and they did it really diligently, all the lateral roots and everything else. And I put plants under stress conditions, putting some salt, and we did it in hydroponics and in pot experiments. We found the salt-sensitive phenotype. So this yellow leaf with chlorosis is the one which was deprived the ability to sense the change in acetylene in the soil because the meristem was removed. And we ended up with a clear explanation. This prevention of signaling from root to shoot by meristem reduce ability of plants to sequester sodium in the vacuole in the leaf. So we have the change in expression level of NHX, NHX and then transported genes for proton pumps in a shoot. And we have the compromised ability to sequester uh, sodium in a shoot vacuoles due to inability to sense the salt stress. So again, if you analyze the ionic relations in the entire the bulk of the root, you will be missing this point, right? So what we need really to do now we need to look at the nature of this signal. So what is produced by meristem? My best guess and advice to student was, oh, it's probably cytokinins because we all know that cytokinins are a major, s well, sorry, root cap is a root apex is a major source of cytokine production. We tried to complement it, it did not work. So it's something else. It can be mRNA, it can be any plant hormones, whatever. We need to study that. But it, it really put us in a sort of promising positions because if we find the nature of that signal, we can relatively simply improve the entire performance of a plant because we know what will be signaling the shoot performance and adaptation in there. Putting RS in a picture, saline stress, similar to many other stresses, is associated with the production of reactive oxygen species in the tissues. So once again, we look at the, we can use the dyes to look at the increase in their intensity, but we look at the sensitivity of different tissues to RSs in a 
experiments with electrophysiological map technique, and we see enormous difference in response between the material and zone and root epics in calcium and potassium fluxes. And one of our students and our students look at the correlation between the sensitivity to us or desensitization of ion channels and the salinity tolerance and found very nice correlation between these in barley and wheat species. And she went even further and she looked at the QTL, so she applied that approach to the mapping populations and she found that there are two clear peaks in a calcium and potassium flux response which really overlap and they overlap with overall salt tolerance. What does it mean? It means that there are some non-selective cation channels, which is permeable for potassium and calcium, which is activated by RS and cause disturbance to ionic homeostasis. And plant varieties, which are more salt tolerant, they're capable to control that performance of that channel and have it less sensitive to RSs. Again, rice, sorghum, other species, we screened dozens of different species for their trite, and we found the same thing uh, to be true. So we have really nice physiological markers there. So the last few minutes I have, I think probably four or five, I'll move from salinity to another example of water logging, which is again a big problem in many places around the world. So here, what do we know about this? Uh, when plants are under hypoxic conditions as created by soil flooding or submergence or water logging, we have a problem with the energy supply. So the mitochondria operation becomes 10, 15 times less efficient, and we have really a reduction in the ATP production. As a result of that, all the pumps, calcium and proton pumps, which are present in plant tissues, become non-functional. So as a result of that, we have really the problems with the loaning of nutrients into the shoot tissues or uptake at the root surface. So the hypoxia starts from the inner part of the root in a steel tissue, and these are the first one to be suffered, right? So with all that, we have a problem of nutrition, we have a problem of adaptation to stresses. You reduce membrane potential and take much more undesirable nutrients and chemicals, so maintenance of membrane potential is critical. And it is done by the HATPase proton pump, which really uh, keeps it uh, negative minus 120, minus 140 millivolts. We can measure that directly. It's like putting electrode in a cell. This one is impalement. So you put the microelectrode into a cell and you have connected to voltmeter, roughly. It's uh, electronics and you measure this membrane potential. So one of my students did this for about 140 DH lines of body using two contrasting parents. And what he found, uh, TX is... Um, Chinese variety, TX9425, and Nazanija was a um, sensitive variety to hypoxia. And what he did, he found just one QTL, which was responsible for maintenance of membrane potential. Again, this is nearly impossible to fake such results because measuring membrane potential, most papers report two or three varieties or genotypes at the same time, and he did 140. So we were very happy with that because this uh, peak coincided with tolerance to flooding and to salinity in Bali as well. And what was interesting, it was not related to any structural HTTP subunit. So it's one of the kinases which really result in regulation. So we try to investigate that. We're looking at the water genes around that QTL right now, and we try to find out the mechanistic explanations. So to wrap up, I believe that the cell-based phenotyping offers a significant advantage to the whole plan screening. You can start with the whole plant phenotyping and pick up the variety which is better, but you cannot explain why it's doing better. If you move from that variety, if you compare contrasting ones and go down to cellular level, and you can mirror QTLs, you can avoid pleiotropic effects, and you'll have, in ideal situation, just one QTL for one protein which operates in that particular tissue. So it allows you really go for this one QTL, one protein principle, which is theoretically impossible in a complex stresses such as salinity or hypoxia or drought stress. It can be applied not only to these stresses, it can be applied to literally every well, type of stresses. Again, heat, cold, frost, I don't really see any problem. Membranes are everywhere. 18% uh, of Rhipidopsis genome is, is associated with membranes with having tra two trans-span domains and 40% somehow associated with membranes. 
So we're talking about all receptors, we're talking about all effectors, we're talking about most of the things which are located membranes, and we can study it non-invasively in most cases. Uh, and in planta, we have pretty high kinetics. The time resolution of our system is five seconds. So we can look at the heavy metals and what we're doing it, cadmium, arsenic. We can look at nutrient use efficiencies for potassium, nitrate, phosphate, whatever resins you have. You can look at the pathogens, you can look at UV damage. Uh, we've done a lot of background work. In fact, we published like more than 300 papers, uh, more or less using this technique. But again, I'm working on, we're working for, for you guys, for breeders or for geneticists. So obviously, I'm just studying what is on my microscope stage and what is in my, my Faraday cage. So whatever material you might have and you believe it's interesting to look at and understand why it's so, uh, most welcome to send me an email. Thank you. Hi, uh, awesome talk. Um, I was wondering, you said you guys had looked at uh, cytokinesin for the signal going up. Have you guys looked at abscisic acid at all? That's a good question. Uh, Bill Davis believed that the abscisic acid travels from root to shoot as a signal. Uh, many papers in recent years sort of disapproved that concept. So the, I think the summary is that it's a redistribution of ABA in a leaf between different compartments, which is important for stomata closure and adaptation to salient and drought. Mm -hmm. But it may be the mRNA or pH change in the xylem signal which caused that redistribution. I got you, yeah. So, well, the answer is we keep it in mind, but I simply limited by number of people and too many interesting topics to look at. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Great. Uh, I totally agree with you. This is the way to go with phenotyping. On the other hand, I wonder the fact that you are working mostly with in vitro systems, if I understood correctly. I mean, where does that leave, for example, the influence of things like the microbiome? I mean, have you actually had the chance to use synthetic communities in your assays to see if also you can phenotype at that point? Uh, our lab experiments, oh, sorry, the results from lab experiments correlate with the field performance of plants in real soil. So obviously, even if we don't measure that, uh, it's still accounted for overall because it's very fundamental things. We're talking about the three major components like imposed by stress, which is ionic disturbance to ionic homeostasis, uh, oxidative stress, and availability of water. And this come with cold, salinity, drought, they're all the same, basically. So we account for that, but there's no doubt that the microbiome of a soil has impact on plant performance. So in fact, we can measure them using our technique. If you tell me how to grow the mycorrhiza in a hydroponic culture, or on the surface of a gut block, I can measure responses plants and mycorrhiza to stress and see if there's any impact and difference. So in fact, we can screen for this compatibility and hosts uh, compatibility. We did it for viruses and we did it for pathogens and we found that potassium flux within five minutes can tell you whether it's a host specific or non-host specific responses from mesophyll. So it's all possible, just a matter of designing the protocols. Uh, Maybe not for high throughput at this stage, but again, give me $3 million and I make a robotic system which will screen hundreds of plants per day. It's, it's, it's trivial technically, it's engineering point of view, just require funding. I, I, I was really well convinced with the story with the salinity, because when breeders have to breed for salinity tolerance, they are facing a mega environment with salinity. With drought, the situation is quite different because drought maybe changing from year to year, from location to location, in intensity, in duration, in timing, and the mechanisms conferring tolerance are quite different for all these things. Do you really think that selecting a particular cell or a particular process would be useful for all the mechanisms for different timing, duration, and intensities of drought? Well, if I answer yes, I'll be a liar, obviously, but uh, uh with drought stress, regardless how severe is the stress, it all starts with osmotic adjustment, right? And decision, close stomata or keep it open. When you close stomata, you reduce the water loss and therefore increase chances for survival. If the stress is mild and plant can get water by other means and osmotically adjust to retain the water, they do not have to close stomata. But this is really done by the strategy how plant adapt to drought stress through synthesis of compatible solutes or by accumulating of inorganic ions. And this is what we can measure at the cellular level with cell-based phenotyping. Another technique is you put the pressure probe single cell in the root 
and you measure the recovery of tugger pressure. In 40 minutes, Arabidopsis recover 95% of tugger pressure by taking sodium, potassium, and chloride. Halophytes have 99% of osmotic adjustment done by sodium and chloride. We bred crops for increase in production of proline, glycine, beta and we target their genes or choline biosynthesis, which comes with energy cost. One cost of uh, proline, one mole of glycine, beta costs cost one or 50 mole of ATP. It's very expensive. So we can adjust, we can do like one fit, uh, one size does not fit everyone, that's for sure. But depending on your expected conditions in the field, we can select varieties which will be following one strategy or another one. And we can really tailor it for a particular region of across Europe, for example. So we expect a high probability that the drought will be more severe in this part of Spain or Greece than this one. And we can fit variety into that particular region based on the strategy how they deal with water stress. Or that they reduce the stomata density or they increase stomata density to, to modify their water use efficiency. Again, it's all, yeah. Yeah, so as I said, there is kind of a trade-off, so I, I was lucky to have all the introduction uh, ready. Everyone talked about the importance of uh, all the stresses and everything, but most of you are in the food coma now. So I'll try to uh, make it uh, uh, as interesting as possible, I'm going to talk about needles in the stress A. I'm Al Friedman from Vulcani Center in Israel. And uh, I'm going to ask whether wild barley alleles can contribute to yield tolerance. And I'm putting it in a question mark because it's not obvious. So wild species were bred or, or were evolved not for yield, but perhaps we can utilize it to, to increase the tolerance to changing environments. And when we talk about changing environments, of course, Everyone has his slides about uh, the constraints of the environment, how it's changing. In this slide, you can see it, uh, especially for wild barley, uh, for barley in general in Europe. C3 plants are suffering the most from uh, constraints of drought and uh, increasing heat. And so, like, uh, I'm, I'm, and I'm going to be balance maybe the previous talk by going from the cellular level, maybe back to the whole plant level, and maybe returning a bit to the cellular level, and you'll see what I'm going to talk about. And so uh, we know uh, reverse genetics approaches, looking for genes, uh, as we can see, we, we just saw, about looking on different processes that are related to stress tolerance, looking for genes that make sense, perhaps uh, even looking differential expression between uh, different uh, uh, conditions, or different, uh, here you can see in this uh, recent uh, a recent study where they look on differential expression under stress between tolerant and non-tolerant uh, barley, and they picked a gene that uh, corresponded to the responses of the of the drought, and they have expressed it in in, uh, in uh, Arabidopsis, and the Arabidopsis looked healthy and fine, so meaning that there is a potential here to increase the the tolerance to to stress. The problem is, or the question is, how relevant are those uh, studies when we look on biomass, or green phenotype, as I call it, to the overall uh, plant performance in the field, or even in pots, when we look on the whole plant. Uh, so we have success stories, very uh, beautiful uh, stories, but the question is how much we can take them to the field. Uh, wild barley, of course, is a, is a major contributor to these uh, possible drought uh, mechanism. But again, when we look on those platforms like the Lemna Tech here in this study, we are looking on green phenotype. We're looking on wild alleles. Here you can see several uh, QTLs that were uh, identified on the Lemna Tech. Yeah, so you can see several QTLs here, how they behave across the, the experiment. And obviously you can find, and this is in the help 25 uh, uh, resource made by uh, uh, Klaus uh, Pilen. I'm going to talk about this uh, resource as well. But nevertheless, these are green phenotypes. Uh, we can identify uh, alleles that will increase maybe the tolerance of growth. The question is how much is related to you. And so our lab in the last, I would say, 15 years is exploring the wild barley. Uh, we started our uh, initiative with, with barley by establishing the Barley 1K. It's a collection done, collected across Israel from 51 sites. And uh, it started as a, a, 
<laughs> is a master project of Saria Lubner was in the lab, and the idea was to treat layer to the environment as layers and pick 51 sites that are different, collect, uh, collect uh, each one 20 accessions in hierarchical mode, and since then we study the genetic makeup a lot with Carl Schmidt along the years, uh, and what we explore uh, recently started to look on plasticity. Whether there is a genetic basis for plasticity, I'm going to talk less about that in regard to the wild barley, but we, we study uh, whether there is was evolution of plasticity, or whether it has an adaptive value in the wild, but also whether it has uh, adaptive value in the, in, the, in the cultivated. And for that, we use uh, two, uh, two interspecific population. One is the one that uh, uh, had 25 made by uh, the pilling group, in which they crossed 25 wild species into the cultivated, made one back horse, and then make a collection of interspecific uh, lines. These are the herb resource, the Halle, Halle exotic barley. And one recent one that we uh, made ourselves, and I'll talk about that in the end of the talk, uh, this is the cytonuclear uh, uh, multipoint population, in which we introduce the cytoplasm from 10 different B1Ks into the cultivated, back it once directionally, and then the second back horse, we added another back horse, and these back horse were done in two directions, meaning that now we have a population that is segregating both for the plasmotype and also for the nucleotype. And on all that, we did double upload, so this one is a fixed population. These are all double upload, they're all uh, being genotyped these days. And I'll get back to that in the, in the end of the talk. So uh, starting with HEP25, the way we do the phenotype, we do the phenotype uh, both by a platform that we developed. We are looking for plasticity of the clock, so we developed a platform for that. Okay, so I'll skip the, the movie, but what you can see here, these are two platforms we use. Platform one is in the field. We grow those plants in the field. We measure their life history traits, looking for yield traits, looking for biomass. We grow them in mini plots, either in, uh, in net houses when we uh, apply some heat to the, to the experiment. And here you can see the delta of the heat in one of those experiments. You can see it here. There is a delta of four to five uh, degrees. And in this uh, platform, in the SensiPan, what we do, we measure the, uh, we grow those plants on our carousel, we grow them and we keep on uh, flashing the light on this every two hours and uh, maintaining the, obtaining the photosynthetic rates. And from that, we calculate the circadian clock output. So this, uh, this slide illustrates uh, uh, I would say the, the problem of looking at uh, is biomass as a measure of uh, uh, tolerance to, uh, to, uh, <coughs> to, to drought or to heat. And what you can see here, I mean, there are several layers of data on this uh, slide. Here you can see this is the GWAS results with the HEP25 that was grown in the field. So here you can see a very strong QTR on chromosome 3 that the wild allele increases the, the biomass significantly in the field under dry, uh, under dry conditions. So that's for the biomass. Interestingly, in this lo same location, I'm not going to talk about it too much, there is also a QTL for the circadian clock plasticity. And what you can see, the colored one, is that we have a signature of selection in the same position. But what you can see here as well, that the same location, the same locus, if you look on the wild allele compared to the cultivated allele, you see reduction in the grain yield. So having a higher biomass under stress is not necessarily a good thing for the, for the crop. There is something going on in the trade-off between the source, the source and the sink. Nevertheless, there are some QTLs, not many, that they would show a beneficial effect. Here you can see an example of one. In this one, this is called DOC11. DOC stands for the drivers of the clock. Again, I'm not going to talk about the clock too much, too much but this locus on chromosome 1, the wild allele, the carrier of the wild allele increases the grain yield under drought. So there is a potential. There are not many loci like that, that the wild allele will increase the grain yield under stress. 
But for us, the one that we invested most of the work so far in looking into more closely into that is what we call the dry tattoo. The dry tattoo came from two years of experiment in the field, measuring grain yield, uh, or grain number or so. And uh, what you can see here, uh, that's the map position on chromosome 2. I mean, genetically, it looks like a very, uh, I would say, appealing uh, locus. But when you look physically, of course, there is a lock of the haplotypes. We all know this locus. This is the HVSN. But what's interesting is that when you look on the effects of this QTL on flowering time, you don't see any interaction. Regardless of water limitation, there is some reduction or acceleration of the flowering, but it, the same goes for all the genotypic uh, groups. But this is not true for gray, for gray number. If you look on gray number, you can see that there is reduction in gray number, only that the wild K or the wild allele have a less reduction. So we figure out there is something going beyond the, beyond the, the flowering. It's not only making the, the plant flower earlier, there is something else that allows the care of the wild allele to withstand the, the stress. So we started to look on the, on, the, on the whole plant and making a pot experiment, a very, uh, I would say, more uh, controlled one, uh, Leanne, what time a uh, postdoc in the lab, started to look on uh, the senescence of the, of the leaves. And what she could observe is that the K of the wild allele, if you take lots of uh, uh, measurements by image analysis and you look on the senescence uh, pace, the senescence is a bit slower, about 7% less in those that carry the wild allele. So this was a good indication for us that something is going on beyond the, the flowering. So if HVSN is the gene, and we're still asking whether this is the gene that does it, and the wild allele confers some Benef uh, beneficiary, then it's not necessarily through the flowering. And I knew the PhD came to the lab, a very talented one, Ayelet, and she decided to take those results and do a blind experiment in which she takes a segregated population. She took the care of the wild allele, that's from the hair population, and she backwards, she crossed it uh, to Barke, she crossed it to Golden Promise, to uh, background and made a segregating population. And she basically took uh, the stems, cut them, and did very tedious work of getting uh, sectioning of, of those uh, stems, did staining, developed an algorithm for her to do high throughput uh, counting of the, of the lignant content in these. And what you can see clearly here that's happening is that unlike the cultivated, here you can see these two values are the cultivated under well water than water limitation. There is no difference in the secondary cell well biogenesis. There is a lot more, uh, 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 <clears throat> I would say, uh, uh, generation of uh, more, uh, st uh, more uh, lignin into the, into the conductive tissue. Whereas if you look on these values, this value compared to this value, these are the care of the wild allele. So what you can see here, that there is plasticity of those that carry the wild allele, they do react to the, in the secondary cellular biogenesis under drought, whereas those that don't carry this allele don't make this uh, effect. And she did it again. And again, those uh, experiments uh, repeat themselves under water limitation. Those that carry the wild allele do show both secondary cell world biogenesis. So there might be something else that plays on the source part of the plant and allow it to uh, maintain a better viability and make more grain number. The interesting thing is, and this may be related to the to previous talk, is that when you look at the expression of the sand, the central radialis, which is the candidate gene, it's expressed in the roots. It's highly expressed in the roots. If you look on the, on the uh, wheat uh, autolog, all those very uh, high bars that you see, the yellow ones, they are all expression in the roots. And I think this comes in a very good time uh, for barley, at least, that nowadays you can do grafting in barley. And I think uh, a good thing about uh, this recent uh, work that was done in uh, Cambridge, they show that you can basically graft anything on anything. You can graft wheat on barley, you can barley on barley or sorghum on barley. So right now we are trying to 
take this idea and see whether it really holds that there might be some kind of a signaling going from the roots for this gene that maybe activates things that are happening in the above, uh, above ground. Okay, so what we are uh, doing with this one as well, uh, we look on the, we start looking more on the variation because it was known that there is a single permutation that makes uh, non synonymous uh, in the protein, but we start thinking maybe there is something else and we kept on sequencing more alleles and when you look on the causal versus non-causal allele of this uh, uh, cell, we do find a, a motive, like a Tata box, which is missing. So we call it HV cell Akuna Tata, or CHAT, that when you lose this, uh, when you compare uh, causal and non-causal uh, lines, they seem to be correspond to what we see for this, uh, uh, for this motive. So we now look in our uh, CHAT population, and in CHAT population, they all have the inversion that Martin talked this morning. They don't have the inversion, but they do have differential appearance of this uh, motive of the chat or the Tata box. So one last slide, and then I'll skip the others because you can go to Yalp Dolach uh, uh, presentation and see it as well. The way we take it, uh, additional one, is because as we've seen also with the black and uh, locus it's very hard to tell where the variation is. So an approach we're trying to develop in the lab is to follow what people have done in, in, the, in the yeast and trying to induce a combination by genome editing. So now we have our interrogation and let's say we overcome the inversion by crossing the right line to the right line, skipping the inversion that holds it, perhaps what we can do, and for us the right to two is a good uh, candidate for that, is basically uh, induce double strand break within the interrogation or around the region that we think is the causal one and then do the phenotype. Of course, it's a long process. We are talking about mitotic combination. It's not an easy thing. It's not very frequent. But we are overcoming many difficulties on the way to start with the design of the double strand break, going and uh, uh, doing the recombination in, uh, in tissue culture and going to the plants. So I'll summarize here and uh, end up with the acknowledgement of the people. I think there is a potential for the wild, but these are very rare QTLs. There are not many. Uh, we have to look on that. Cellular level is a good thing, but I think it should complement also with looking at the whole plant level. We need to realize how those plants act, how the how the relationship between the source and the sink. For us, pleotropic QTLs are the best resource to do that in order to look on different levels of phenotype. As I said, biomass is, is an important trait, but still, if you look on grain yield, it's something that has to be considered in a context. And uh, the problem also with wild alleles is that they are locked uh, haplotypes, and perhaps what we try at least to do is to live in crosses within wild integration to overcome problems like we have with the dry to two. So as I said, uh, more than that, uh, I'll, I urge you to go and, uh, and look on the uh, Yard Dolach uh, poster. He's going to talk about the champ and show him very nice thing. The champ is now going to grow in Israel in uh, several locations, but also in California. I'll skip this one. I will talk about that. And I'll just finish by acknowledging the, the group and uh, people along the years. Uh, also, Klaus, of course, for showing us the F25, working uh, for many years together. Thank you for your attention. Um, yeah, thanks for the very interesting talk. And uh, so it's um, the same as we try to do with the uh, wild barley to in include it or to ingress it into cultivated barley. But the problem usually is linkage drag. And so you have to get a hand on this one, either by back crossing or now CRISPR-Cas mediated uh, uh, introduction. What, what's your um, guess what will be the future? So going for crispr cross to get rid of all the non-advantages um, uh, uh, genes next to the gene you want to introduce? I think first of all uh, the, important, the important thing to realize that we are talking about uh, natural alleles and I, I, I don't, I'm not a great believer in knockouts. I mean you don't do biology with a five kilo hammer. You have to do, these are very you know, contextual alleles, so uh, expression matters, the, the time it expresses, 
in which T-shirt expresses, if I, if, you know, I cannot predict the future, I, I mean, that's uh, obviously, but again, even doing the RECAS 9, it has to be much more efficient than the way we try uh, to do it these days. But I think once it's going to work, it's going to be another tool. It's not going to replace, you know, you will have another tool to work with. You will not be, you cannot escape a combination, especially when you look on natural alleles. What we think is also that now uh, there is a new, a new uh, player come to the arena and these are the, this is the plasma type. I haven't showed it and I will show it the significant effect of wild plasma type on the phenotype. Now whether those will have a penalty, kind of a drag, drag other phenotypes, you don't know, but I can sure tell you that they affect the, they affect the flowering time dramatically. Now whether those will interact well with the, with the nucleotype, I don't know. But again, whatever I, I presented, I think it's another uh, layer, another tool to basically tackle those alleles. But in the end of the day, it's, I find it hard to believe that knockouts will give you the answers. They will help you, but they will not tell you how the, the, the biology works. But sorry, I didn't mean it's knockouts, close, but... Sorry, then... but we have to go ahead. So please uh, find Eyal during the breaks. <laughs> Thanks, and sorry. Thank you very much, Ernesto, for a nice introduction. I would like to thank you organizers also for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share our results with you. I'm very happy, by the way, that we can see each other face to face. It's really a pleasure to be here. So I would like to tell you a story about transcriptome landscape of barley with the focus on alternative splicing. And then I will show you how it surprisingly led us to the story of one of our mutants that we are working with. So, as the introduction, I would like to focus your attention on what we can do as plant scientists in the face of climate change. So, as we know, uh, it's not really optimistic. The arable land affected by drought stress has increased twice in the last 40 years. And 80% of economy, uh, economical losses in developing countries caused by drought affected agricultural sector already. So, basically, what we can do is to identify key regulatory genes, then to discern the mechanism of drought response, and also to use that knowledge to control plants' drought response. And concerning the mechanism, one of the mechanisms can be alternative splicing. And we know that in Arabidopsis, more than 60% of multi-exon genes undergo alternative splicing, and this number even increased when plants are exposed to drought or any other stress. So we ask a question, to what extent does the alternative splicing change the expression of genes and influence the drought response in barley? To do that, we use chat tools which are available thanks to our colleagues from James Hutton Institute. We have a highly resolved um, barley reference transcriptome recently published in Plant Journal. And for that reason, we performed drought stress, of course, for uh, Sebastian cultivar, which is really important for us in Katowice because we have also hortilus population, uh, teething population for looking uh, for mutation in some genes of interest. So for that uh, reason, we performed also RNA-seq. And we discovered that almost more than half of genes which were expressed respond uh, differentially to drought stress. 30% of them were regulated via alternative splicing. So when we looked deeper in these genes that were regulated at the level of transcription, down-regulated genes were mostly annotated as photosynthesis-related process, which, which is not really surprising to us, because we know that photosynthesis is uh, much inhibited in response to stress. We also confirmed that by physiological analysis, uh, using uh, fluorescence of chlorophyll, we were able to discern that the photosynthesis is really decreased in our plants after drought stress treatment. When you look at these two curves, the purple one is for drought stress, the yellow one is for control plants, you see that the purple line is decreasing. Uh, it means that plants really suffer because of the drought stress. So when you look at the second uh, curve, you will see uh, differential peaks, and these peaks indicate uh, bad things which are happening. For example, in case of uh, peak K and I in oxygen evolving complex, and peak 
H uh, designated for uh, ferrodoxin, which is acceptor of the photosystem one. We looked also at the stomata, which were really, really closed in response to drought stress in our case, and the chlorophyll content was also decreased. So taking together this physiological and transcriptomical data, we were able, using CAG annotation, to annotate almost 150 genes uh, in barley, which are encoding crucial core components of photosystems, of electron transport components, and also calvin Klein enzymes. So going further, we looked also at the genes that were upregulated in response to drought stress and the vast of them were annotated as response to abscisic acid. Of course, we were able to identify also genes involved in other phytohormones, and here you can see uh, rough numbers. But going to abscisic acid, which is really important in response to drought stress, we are able to identify genes that were involved in transport, in metabolism, uh, in core signaling of abscisic acid, I mean receptors, phosphatases, kinases, and also post-translational modification of proteins, as well as further stages of the signaling. We're able also to identify transcription factors or factors that are involved in transcription regulation. And among them was CBP80, which is really important to us. And you can uh, visit poster of my PhD student. During poster session, she will present also results regarding CBP80 in our mutants in barley. But this is story for another uh, occasion. Tomorrow, to, today, I will focus on this alternative splicing. So uh, taking into account that abscisic acid involvement in drought stress, we also uh, checked the endogenous content of abscisic acid and its metabolites in our drought stress plants. So we've noticed that uh, all of these um, were increased in response to drought stress, uh, as also reflected gene expression because we have uh, upregulation of genes involved in uh, biosynthesis of abscisic acid as well as metabolism. So going further, uh, we wanted to focus on these alternatively spliced genes, which were 30% of all differentially expressed genes. When we uh, tried to figure out also the regulation of that uh, events of these events, we wanted to see also in numbers how many transcription factors are, and how many splicing factors are involved in the regulation when we were considered genes that were regulated only as uh, transcriptional regulation of gene expression, only uh, alternative splicing and at the both uh, level of regulation. So here you see the numbers and the most uh, interesting to us was uh, transcription factors and splicing factors which were identified in genes regulated only by splicing. So when we looked at the uh, annotation of these genes, we noticed that for uh, alternative splicing and then the isoform switching, which is really interesting also event because we can distinguish between really usage of some transcripts in uh, drought response. Mm, most of them were involved in RNA metabolic processes and also response to unfolded proteins. When we wanted to check which transcripts are really responsible for gene being identified as alternatively spliced, uh, regulated, we looked at differentially transcript usage. And we noticed that most of them are encoding transcripts that go for a premature termination codon, which is in line also with literature data because most of the events in plants in alternative splicing are intron retention that leads uh, mostly to um, PTC. So further, when we looked at the annotation, as I said, uh, mostly of them were involved in RNA metabolic processes and also response to unfolded proteins. So then we looked at isoform switching, and it was really interesting because we were able to uh, see different, uh, differentially isoform switching uh, in crucial genes responding uh, responding to uh, drought stress. So here I will show you some interesting results. Uh, the first one is heat shock protein uh, 70, which 
uh, is represented by two isoforms and is regulated not only at the alternative splicing level, but also at the transcriptional level of regulation. So when we looked at uh, the isoform switching, we noticed that the one which is preferred is coding as the same as the one that is uh, not preferred under drought stress. So we asked, okay, what is the difference? We saw at the gene expression level that this gene was upregulated. So somehow it should be important. That's why we aligned the sequences and we noticed that that one which is preferred under drought stress is really functional shock 70 protein, which is important chaperone for stress response in plants. And it was in uh, that category that I said to you, uh, response to unfolded proteins among others. The next one uh, is involved uh, in biosynthesis of functional important plastohinion and ubihinion. So it's really important for the photosynthesis. Here uh, we identified three isoform switching events and in each of them, the one that was preferred under drought stress was unproductive. And also we noticed that at the gene expression level, it was downregulated. So it can be uh, somehow uh, linked to uh, inhibition of photosynthesis uh, indirectly also. Then uh, we looked at genes uh, which were annotated among other annotations as a response to water deprivation. And here we noticed one which was really, really interesting to us, the protein farnesyl transferase subunit alpha. Why is it so interesting to us? Because it's involved in farnesylation process, and I will tell you uh, for a moment a story about the mutant in ERA1 gene, which is encoding the beta subunit of this farnesyl transferase. So, in case of subunit alpha, we've noticed that uh, the preferred uh, isoform is coding, but uh, this farnesyl transferase is negative re uh, regulator of drought response. So it was kind of surprising. But then uh, we aligned that uh, isoform with the one which is encoding the functional FTA. And we've noticed that this preferred isoform is coding sequence, but this is, uh, la it lacks the uh, functional domain of FTAs. So it's not really uh, working under stress, which is good for plant. Because when you look at the farnesyl transferase, you will notice that it's a heterodimer consisting of two subunits. The one is alpha subunit and the second is beta subunit. And this alpha subunit was represented in our transcriptomic data and beta subunit is really important for the process of farnesylation, which is basically attaching the prenyl group to the proteins at the highly conserved end of the proteins and this farnesylation modifies proteins to activate it or attach the membrane to perform its function, this protein function of course. So this is pretty conserved mechanism. It's uh, also occurring in our cells, in human cells. And for example, the uh, permanent farnesylation of some proteins in our nucleus uh, is uh, the cause of progeria. So it's really important process in the cell and highly conserved. So it was really surprising that Arabidopsis mutants in ERA1 gene are hypersensitive to abscisic acid and also drought tolerant. So, using our tilling population, we identified a mutant in barley, in ERA1 gene, and uh, using also kind of translational genomics, we perform experiments on Arabidopsis and barley at the same time. As such, we uh, noticed that relative water content, so the water stored in leaves after drought stress, was really increased in the mutant when compared with the wild type, it was higher 30%. Then we've noticed that the photosynthesis of the mutant is somehow better after drought stress than in the wild type. The same was observed in the Arabidopsis. So then we looked closer to the gene expression. And what we noticed, the genes which were upregulated after drought stress in ERA1 mutant were involved in galactolipid synthesis. And galactolipids are the special lipids which build the chloroplast membranes, the tilakoids membranes. So, we ask a question, can it be a link between better photosynthesis in ERA1 mutant and uh, the cause of that?
So putting these puzzles together, better photosynthesis, the higher expression of genes annotated as uh, galactolipids, we wanted to check if galactolipids content is increased in the mutant, and it was. It was twice when compared the mutant in control condition and after drought stress. But what you notice for sure, the level of galactolipids was in the control condition lower than in the wild type. So for that question, I don't know the answer yet, but hopefully I will soon. So then uh, we looked also at the chloroplast ultrastructure of the mutant and the wild type under control and drought conditions. So when we looked at the control pictures, you can easily notice that already under control conditions, the stacks of thylakoids were higher than uh, in the wild type. And after drought stress, the level of destruction of the chloroplast was much more uh, lower in the mutant when compared with the wild type. Okay, but it was observed only at the seedling stage, and for sure you will ask what about further stages of development. So, using plant array system, we performed uh, drought stress at the heading stage of development, and we noticed that mutant was able to recover much faster than the wild type in terms of stomata conductance in, uh, when, when stressed with drought. And then... Five minutes. Okay. And then uh, it recovered almost in 100% when the Sebastian, the parental line, in the same time was at the level of 60% of somatic um, conductance. So after all experiments, we were also able to calculate water use efficiency and the mutant had higher water use efficiency uh, when compared to the white type. So to summarize that uh, part, uh, we can obviously say that mutants have better photosynthesis and better water saving mechanism. At the heading stage, it better recovers after drought stress. And also, it's important to focus on this evolutionary context of ERA1 gene. It has a potential to translate it to other crops, maybe. That's why I say potential, but it looks really, really promising. So, for summarization of the part uh, concerning the alternative splicing which led us to this ERA1 mutant also, I would like to say that it's uh, kind of uh, interconnected regulations where transcription factors are interplay with splicing factors to establish proper transcriptome reprogramming. And what we notice also, but it's just a kind of a shy hypothesis right now, uh, it looks like alternative splicing helps somehow plants with unfolded, misfolded proteins, for example, via chaperone activity. And at the same time, alternative splicing inhibits process of import of misfolded proteins into nucleus by uh, alternative spliced transcripts for importance or proteins that perform post-translational protein uh, modification. So we were able to um, identify uh, 140 splicing and transcriptions regulatory barrier genes that were uh, regulated only at the alternative splicing way. And uh, future work, of course, will address the function of these putative uh, regulators and to build some interactions between them. Also, we are in progress of uh, isosex sequencing, which will shed a light for sure. So uh, I would like to thank all people involved in this research, mostly my group, Plant Genetics and Functional Genomics Group for University of Silesia, and our collaborators and of course agencies that funded uh, our research. And a little adver advertisement, if you know somebody eager to work on barrier response to drought stress and digging with some bioinformatics data, we are looking for bioinformatician in the project. Thank you very much for your attention and I will be happy to take some questions. So how do you go about quantifying the alternative splice transcripts? Because you will have portions of your reads that are actually matching all transcripts, but it will be only a part of them that will allow you to distinguish them. So what kind of program or, or how did you go about that? Okay, so uh, we use for that reason, uh, for that purpose, uh, the established pipeline for uh, different transcript and alternative uh, transcript uh, identification. It's uh, developed by James Hutton Institute and it's uh, dedicated for that uh, kind of analysis.
So it allowed us to identify not only differentially expressed genes, but also alternative spliced genes and this differentially transcript usage and isoform switching. So today I'm here to talk about drought response and recovery in barley. And before I start, I would like to give you an overview of my presentation. I'll first talk about the physiological properties of four barley varieties that I have worked with. And then the gene expression analysis in Golden Promise. And then stress activation of uh, retrotransposone in barley in the four barley varieties. Starting with uh, barley in Finland. So uh, Finland is the world's northernmost cereal producing crop. And uh, barley is the most produced cereal crop in Finland, um, contributing 40% of the total cereal production. Now if we compare the weather of Finland uh, with Spain, so the summer in Finland is similar to the winter in Spain, uh, the temperature. And the precipitation during uh, summer in Finland goes high, and in Spain it goes down. As uh, mentioned by uh, previous speakers, that climate is changing, and drought is one of the most affecting environmental stress, causing 80% of the crop uh, loss, depending on the crop and the area. And in Finland, early summer droughts are the most common one, which affects the critical yield determination phase of spring, spring cereals. And uh, ultimately, it affects the grain set. So um, here um, in this experiment, uh, we have tried to grow the plant in a minimally controlled greenhouse because it's difficult to imitate what a plant goes through in the field. So uh, we, we have grown the plant in a minimally controlled greenhouse with natural lights and uh, temperature and relative humidity. And the plants were monitored by high throughput functional phenotyping system, which takes the measurement of the plant by weight in every three minutes simultaneously for all the crops uh, in the system. And uh, it measures the whole plant water relations and many physiological parameters. And uh, the, the varieties that I have used here is Golden Promise because it's a transformation genotype. Morex as a reference genome. Arvo and Hankia, these are the two Finnish varieties having high and low stomatal conductance. And this experiment was done in Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Israel. So uh, the graph below, you can see the red line is the vapor pressure deficit during the whole experimental time. And the gray lines are the light during that time. And uh, the, the graph above is the normalized system weight. Uh, the line which is going straight are the control plants of uh, four different barley varieties and the line going downwards are the stressed plants. This experiment is divided into five phases, well watered, dry phase one, recovery one, dry phase two and recovery two. For RNA, I have collected samples uh, at well watered, after the stress and after the recovery. So as I mentioned that uh, we have collected, like we uh, got a lot of physiological parameters, but here I'm going to explain only three of them, starting with uh, daily transpiration. So this, the graph above is daily transpiration of golden promise. If you see here that the pattern of uh, control and drought plants are uh, going at the same same way until day 29 and after day 29 there is a transpiration break where uh, the drought plants started going down as compared to the control and this happened in dry phase two for golden promise and for uh, arvo it happened also in day 29 in hankia at day 25 and for morex at day 20. Here, uh, Morex had the highest transpiration and Golden Promise had the lowest transpiration. Now, the next uh, physiological parameter that we see here is the specific daily weight change. So that is the gain or loss of uh, weight changed per day. And uh, here also for Golden Promise, we see after day 29, the, 
droughted plants uh, started separating from control plants, showing that the, uh, there is a weight loss. And for Arvo, uh, also at day 29, and Hankia around day 29 and 30, and for Morex, it was earlier at day 23. So what we observed here is there is a pattern in uh, the divergence, divergence point of drought from control. And first we saw a break in transpiration and then the weight. The next um, physiological parameter is the critical soil water content. So um, this is a graph uh, which is uh, transpiration rate plotted against uh, calculated volumetric water content. So if you see the um, transpiration rate is constant up to a certain volume, uh, volumetric water content and then it breaks sharply and the point where it breaks sharply is known as the critical soil water content or theta critical point and then after that the transpiration goes down and it's linear showing that the volumetric water content is a limiting factor for transpiration here. And if we compare the varieties, so the red line is the golden promise, and the blue line above is Morex, and they both reach the theta critical point around same uh, calculated volumetric water content. And on the other hand, Arvo and Hankia, they uh, reach the theta critical point earlier than these two varieties. So here we can um, predict that uh, golden promise and Morex are the varieties that, that are taking, trying to take risk or they are taking risk to survive in low soil water content as compared to Arvo and Ahankia because even if they have water, they, are, um, they, they reach the theta critical point before uh, other, two, other two varieties. So I would like to conclude in the physiology part um, that golden promise, which is having a low transpiration, it responds to low soil water content and they are anisohydric like, which is a water use strategy uh, of uh, risk taking varieties. And Morex having high transpiration and response at low soil water content, also a risk taking variety. On the other hand, Arvo and Hankia, they have high transpiration and the response at high soil water content and they are the non-risk taking type varieties and isohydric like. Now I would like to go to the next segment of my presentation, which is the gene expression analysis. And here uh, we checked the, we did the RNA sequencing and we checked the dispersion of the genes and the uh, principal component analysis to ch check the different uh, groups of the treatment. And approximately 27,000 genes were expressed and uh, thir 33 million reads per sample. So here, uh, what I did was I did network analysis, and for that, uh, I used GeoProfiler and Cytoscape. And now I'm going to show you the results from this uh, analysis. So first, uh, I saw the in in the drought networks, we saw an upregulated uh, upregulation of uh, stress-related genes. And here uh, you see the three clusters, and each cluster has nodes, these orange circles. They are nodes, and they, uh, each node has many genes. And uh, the darker the node, the more significant it is. So we saw the genes that are related to response to water and acid and uh, different salt stress. And as expected, uh, during uh, drought, we saw a downregulation of growth and development related genes, including photosynthesis and pigment biosynthesis and uh, plant ovary development. Then we saw um, an upregulation of growth related genes during recovery, showing that the cells are coming back to the uh, original status. And interestingly, we saw a downregulation of autophagy related genes here. So, um, autophagy is a process where a cell um, recycles its cellular component by eliminating the degraded protein in it so that it can balance uh, uh, cellular uh, homeostasis. And um, this is also found in humans uh, when, uh, when we do fasting. So, Yoshinori Osomi uh, got Nobel Prize in 2016 for this uh, process, for this mechanism. So uh, 
Then um, I'm just going to show the, some of the list of the uh, upregulated genes in drought, which includes uh, the genes related to stress, like dehydrin and glutathione S transferase, and the genes r related to um, growth and development, in, uh, which are downregulated in drought. Similarly, during recovery, these are the list of genes that went up and the list of genes that uh, are downregulated, including the retrovirus-related genes. Now I will talk about the third segment of my presentation, which is retrotransposons. So retrotransposon is a class one transposable element, and in barley, more than 80% of barley genome is uh, having transposable elements. So retrotransposons are the genetic components that copy and paste themselves into different genomic location by converting RNA back into DNA through reverse transcription. Bear one which is a barley retro element, and it is the uh, most active uh, retro element in Copia superfamily in barley, and it is uh, bounded by 1.8 KB long terminal re repeats on both ends, and the uh, internal domain contains GAG as capsid protein and polyproteins. So it occupies 15% of barley genome. Uh, previous research in our lab uh, from Marco Yaskalainen, we found that BEAR1 expression strongly varies between the tissues, and it is mostly abundant in developing embryo, germinating embryo, and scutellum. And a simple drought experiment in cultivar BOMI uh, showed that the, in drought plants, the GAG protein is more than the well watered. So here with these samples, uh, we decided to do qPCR to check the mRNA level of bare gag uh, in these four varieties in drought and recovery. And uh, typically what we expect that expect the bare uh, gag ex expression to go high with the stress, which we observed in uh, Golden Promise and Arvo. So wherever there is uh, increase in stress, there is increase in gag expression. And during recovery, where there is a decrease in stress, there is a decrease in gag expression. In Hangia drought, it behaved similarly like Golden Promise and Arvo. But uh, Hangia recovery, uh, it seems that three days were not enough for Hangia to recover from stress. So the plants still feel the stress, and that's why the gag expression was still high. But uh, surprisingly, Morex had no correlation with the stress. And uh, where the stress is high, the gag expression was low. And where the stress is low in recovery, the gag expression was high. So I would like to conclude by saying that retrotransposons, they, um, the bear response to stress at mRNA level. And we could see a varietal difference in bear expressions. And maybe not all varieties behave in a typical way that we expect. In physiological properties, we saw a differential water use strategies. And there is a similarity in transpiration and weight loss patterns. And in gene expression analysis, we saw a growth, the growth-related genes underexpressed in drought and reset of the cell status during recovery, and the stress genes expressed in drought and autophagy-related genes going down during recovery. Yes. Thank you. And uh, I would like to thank my group members and uh, Alan and the uh, uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Menachem, with whom I could uh, do this experiment, Erasmus Mundus, U and University of Helsinki. Thank you. And looking at, your, at the response of your different varieties, yeah. does the location in which the varieties developed make a difference in their response? Yes, I think so, because uh, uh, Golden Promise, it's from the uh, British, so it's from the cold place, and Morex, it's from a dry place. So they are from two extreme places, and that's why they can maybe survive in uh, low soil water content. Uh, whereas Arvo and Hankia, which are the two Finnish varieties, and they are from somewhere in the middle, so uh, they are, and they are like. Uh, uh, drought, uh, they don't want to take any risks for, for, for the drought. So I think location plays a role. Yes. In that situation, in which 
Yeah. Uh, approach or, or definition is taken is it transpiration on a single leaf or the whole plant transpiration? It's the whole plant transpiration. It's not per, per unit of leaf area. It's the whole plant. Yes, because uh, their system, they, um, they it it has uh, uh, their system can calculate the whole plant uh, transpiration. Yes. Then more than a question, I have a very quick comment. Yes. I think we need to be careful on the wording we use yeah. for defining things because Moritz was a risky variety yeah. that keep higher rates of transpiration all throughout the system. So yeah. I didn't see taking any risk. I, so it doing better than the others all the time in any condition. Yes. Uh, so yeah. it, I don't know. It, it's just a very comment. It's not a question. It's just a comment that we need to be careful on what does it mean to take a risk? Probably uh, nothing else. Well, I, I, I can understand you because it's, it's very relative. Like It depends on with which variety we are comparing with. So, uh, yeah. yeah when you translate to a particular gene, that is a risk avoidance. Yeah. Probably you may, uh, you, you influence uh, deciding to use the gene that reduce transpiration instead of maintain activity. Okay, yeah. Thank you.